Join us as we discuss with Professor James Penton, author of such books as Jehovah's Witnesses in Canada, Apocalypse Delayed, and Jehovah's Witnesses and the Third Reich. We talk about his own personal history, Jehovah's Witness history, and what he's up to now. Welcome, everybody. Our guest needs no introduction. This is Jim Penton. He's one of the leading Watchtower historians who's written a, a couple books on Watchtower history, Apocalypse Delayed, and Jehovah's Witnesses yes. and the Third Reich. Yes, that's right. Paul needs an updated edition there, I think. I have a second. <laughs> yes, it does. Yes, it does. And Jehovah's Witnesses and the Third Reich. Uh, Jim left the Watchtower 40-some years ago, and we're going to talk to him about his family history in Watchtower as well as his personal journey and and where his personal journey has led him to today. So, Jim, what's your family's history in Watchtower? Yes, my, my great-grandfather and his second wife uh, became Bible students sometime around 1900. And uh, through them, my grandmother, his, da his daughter-in-law, also became uh, a Bible student. She was uh, baptized in uh, 1908 and went through the traumas of uh, the First World War, which in Canada were uh, pretty severe. The literature of the Watchtower Society, much of it was uh, banned. The police came and uh, if you had any Watchtower literature, it was subject to a uh, $5,000 fine and several years in prison just for having the Watchtower literature. Uh, after the war, the organization led by Judge Rutherford uh, concluded that the end would come in 1925 my grandmother was not happy with much that went in in the organization. I think had she not uh, stood up uh, as a Bible student in the First World War, she probably would have left. She didn't really know what was going on at the headquarters of the organization, but she came to dislike uh, the first or the second uh, uh, president of the Watchtower Society, J.F. Rutherford. She wrote him a letter. What, uh, what was, oh, what, do you have that letter? Yeah, she oh, beat I, me to it. <laughs> I, I don't have that. Unfortunately, I don't have that. And she told me about the whole matter. Uh, before she, you go into that story. Yes. Okay, what, what was her name? Margaret May Thomas Penton. And, and your, your uh, grandfather's name? My grandfather's name was uh, George Penton. And he okay. was a board, George Penton, MD. He was a, uh, a doctor and he also had a license as a pharmacist. Okay, hold on one second. I'm gonna show you something that I found here. Right. Jim Penton, this is your life. Here is Mrs. G.E. Penton, June 26, 1916. Right. And it, and she's writing the Enterprise, thanking them for something they wrote about the holidays. And I like what she says here. It reached this prairie frontier woman and many thanks. I always enjoy the Enterprise. Did you know that was in there? I didn't know there at all. I didn't know there that there, it was there at all. That's an amazing thing to me. Here, yes, here's one more. Grandmother. That was your mother? My grandmother. Your grandmother. She was a wonderful woman. And uh, she ultimately left the Watchtower a year or two before she died. Oh, she did. So here she is again, and this is in 1925. Very and she's listening. She's listening to WORD. But I'm sure she also listened to Chuck in Saskatchewan. Yes, she probably did. So she says, we live 15 and a half miles north out of the Montana boundary line in southern Saskatchewan. That's right. And find the line is not an imaginary one in many ways. 
but so far has it has not been able to hold up the radio programs from coming across duty free. We are thankful for we are thankful for that with all our many blessings. Those are the only two I found from her. But oh my goodness, no, that's something I had no idea of. But uh, I wanted was, to surprise you. <laughs> she was loyal, although she was very open, and uh, she she thought a lot of uh, Pastor Russell. But uh, she didn't like uh, Judge Rutherford. She thought that he was uh, too brusque, too severe. And there were a lot of things that she didn't agree with. And she particularly didn't agree with the idea of being forced to go door to door. She thought that that was wrong. And she thought it was perfectly all right to go to door from door to door if you had that calling or if you felt that that was the thing that you should do evangelism is all right but to force everybody to carry it out was very wrong and there were other things that christians should do so she was a wonderful woman evangelism is one of those gifts of the spirit not everyone has that particular gift that's right now, you said she left the organization. What year and how around and how old was she? Oh, she was in her 80s. But she and another sister uh, were, oh, I would say about 82, 83. She died when she was uh, 85. Uh, she said, she told my, my wife uh, of that time what had happened. She said that she and another sister she had returned to her home in Wisconsin. She was born and raised in uh, Western Wisconsin. Black River Falls was the name of the place. And the two of them were very close. They were both about the same age. And uh, they were on the point of writing a letter. And then they said, why should we bother? It would just create uh, a little flame and everybody would ignore us and say they're old, just old women and pay no attention to them. So we'd just stay home and uh, we won't uh, uh, associate with the local congregation. When they come to the door, we'll be very nice to them. But uh, she got letter literature from the Don and uh, from PBI and uh, she kept it in the house and she read it and uh, she felt that uh, the organization had overstepped and was very wrong and so she changed her will didn't contrib contribute very much to if any to the watchtower society and uh, she told my wife who took her into uh her confidence that uh, she didn't believe that the resurrection had taken place in 1918. She thought that was quite wrong. And uh, consequently, uh, some of this I got secondhand. I don't know why she didn't tell me. She did tell me about not contributing to the Watchtower. But uh, uh, then she died. She was a wonderful woman. Uh, as you know, the Watchtower Society under Rutherford and ever since has been very much against uh, education, particularly post high school education. Well, it was my grandmother who helped me financially to get not only a bachelor's and a master's degree, but a doctorate. And I, I thank God for her. She was a wonderful woman. Uh, I so, so what, 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 and let's go back one second. So what did, at the time you were still a witness, what did you think of your grandmother for dropping out? Well, by the time she dropped out, I was beginning to ask a lot of questions myself. Okay. And neither my wife and I, we were just kids when we were married. We were very much in love and we had a wonderful marriage. We lived together for 62 years. And uh, she had been pioneering for the witnesses. And she hated it. 
and uh, she said, uh, Jim, how can we get out uh, from under this pressure to go pioneering, evangelizing for the Watchtower Society? And I said to her, Marilyn, the best way is for us to start a family. And so we did. And we rejoiced over that, and I rejoice ever, have rejoiced over that ever since. Neither one of us liked the idea of door knocking. I had tried it a little bit as a salesperson when I was uh, going to university, and I found it very tough, and I didn't like it. And uh, I, I hated bringing any kind of pressure on people. So I went to university at in Tucson, Arizona, got my uh, bachelor's degree there, although I had taken my first year in college in Wisconsin in... Uh, Whitewater? Pardon? In Whitewater? No, not Whitewater. It was uh, Eau Claire. Okay. You know, and in Eau Claire. And... Uh, then after I got my uh, BA, I went to uh, the University of Iowa, where I got a, both a, a master's degree and a PhD in history with a, uh, a minor in uh, religious studies. And I was treated very well there. And uh, I took classes under... Uh, a Lutheran minister, uh, classes from a Catholic priest, uh, and the person that I liked the most was uh, a, uh, a Jewish man who was extremely kind to me. But all of these people thought that I was a kind of a strange bird, uh, a Jehovah's Witness, and uh, there was no persecution from any of them. They were very tolerant, very, very kind, extremely kind men. And in the, the uh, uh, field of history, uh, I was under several men who were outstanding historians. The medieval historian that I worked under was uh, a church historian. And he and I got along just as personal friends. It was very, very wonderful, the experience that I had. And finally, when I was working on my dissertation, I got a job at uh, Whitewater, Wisconsin. Yeah, that's my home area, right? In that your area there. home area, yeah. yes. And I had a wonderful year there. But uh, the... Uh, Vietnamese war was getting hotter at the time, and my boys by that time were, well, David was in his early teens, and John was a couple years younger, and uh, I said, if this war keeps up, uh, they're going to want to attempt to draft my sons, and uh, uh, I didn't want that, and I got an offer to go back to Canada to uh, the University of Calgary, and I was there two years, and then I moved to Lethbridge, Alberta. Uh, a new university was starting up, and I found uh, that I liked the men and their uh, attitudes, and I went to... Uh, Lethbridge and had a very, very fine career there with uh, the administration and with my colleagues. Uh, oh, there were rough times that people didn't agree, but th th I never felt uh, anything like persecution from mm -hmm. being a Jehovah's Witness. It's hardly the picture that the Jehovah's Witnesses portray. Because we're Jehovah's Witnesses, we're going to be persecuted, and yet you weren't. I, I certainly wasn't by uh, by the people in the universities, and they respected me, and they they uh, often asked me uh, how I felt about things. And it was at that time that I wrote Jehovah's Witnesses in Canada, my first book, which needs a lot of revision right now. <laughs> <laughs> I was just going to ask you, how did you, what led you to write that book, and then what do you think needs revision? 
Well, the uh, thing that led me to write that book was that I had experienced the terrible persecution of Jehovah's Witnesses in World War II from uh, uh, July the 4th, 1940 to uh, 1943 uh, and the, la the uh, later, later part of uh, October, I think the last day of October, the witnesses were under a complete ban and there were cases where uh, they, they were treated terribly. One family in Ontario had a little boy and he went to school and wouldn't salute the flag and he was taken from his parents and so did the, and so also mm -hmm. was a, an infant child and uh, uh, they were imprisoned, the parents were imprisoned without any opportunity to call a lawyer or get anyone in touch for time. And that sort of thing was carried on for some time. And the, uh, the witnesses were outlawed in such a way that if you had a King James Bible without any comments in it, simply because it was published by the Watchtower Society, you could be uh, imprisoned and uh, fined for having this Bible at the very same time that the uh, uh, that Hitler's uh, uh, Mein Kampf was still in libraries and you could get Hitler, but you couldn't get the King James Bible because it was published by the Watchtower. <laughs> and uh, then after the war, there was a long and bitter fight with the uh, government of uh, Quebec and the Catholic hierarchy actually when I wrote uh, Jehovah's Witnesses in Canada, I uh, went to the library and with the help of some other uh, witnesses, we discovered that uh, there were the direct letters from the Catholic Arch Archbishop of Quebec to the uh, so-called liberal government of that time and the uh, Minister of Justice, who was really sh should have been called the Minister of Un Injustice, he simply said, uh, yes, uh, your Lordship, uh, here I'm outlawing Jehovah's Witnesses. And that went on till the end of the war, or to a, an extent, because the literature was still ba uh, uh, banned, and uh, a lot of young men were taken up and put in concentration camps and remained there for a year after the war. So it was with this spirit of uh, feeling that what the government of Canada had done was so wrong that I wrote that book. But I relied too much on the uh, tales of the Watchtower Society in the first chapter. And, Jeff uh, and I just had a, a discussion that is it published yet? I don't. No, no. We oh, we, we've done a review of Faith in Action, which is by the time this interview has happened, it will have been published. So. Uh, <laughs> but, but yeah, Jeff and I ha had a discussion where we go through newspapers showing what the clergy's actual opinions mm. and statements were for that, and and even how um, a lot of it seemed to be the society instigated the fight to get them to retaliate. So. Well, of course, they were uh, they were really uh, loud mouthed, if I may say so, in their criticisms of the clergy. But every one of their criticisms were true. Uh, particularly in the First World War, it was the Protestants who brought about the banning of them. In the Second World War, it was the Catholic Church. And of course, right now I'm working on a, a book on religious persecution in Canada. Canadians are a little bit holier than thou, uh, and so are Americans. The difference is that most of the real persecution of all of these people 
came from the top down in Canada, from the federal or provincial governments. Very little mob action. There was some, but not much. But in the United States, while the United States government wasn't uh, going after them in so hard a way, the Supreme Court did for three years, but outside of that, it wasn't the government, governments which uh, really persecuted the witnesses and others. It was mob violence uh, arising from uh, racist attitudes and misdirected attitudes as far as uh, the, the press and the government was concerned. Uh, so it's a, a different type of persecution in the two countries. Was it more severe in the First World War or Second World War? It was more severe in the Second World That's War. Right. But in both World Wars, conscientious objectors, not only uh, Bible students and Jehovah's Witnesses, but also in the First World War, the Pentecostals, Mennonites were, were actually tortured by the authorities, mm. the military authorities in both world wars, outright torture. And in one case, in uh, the First World War, a Pentecostal was treated so severely that he died. So uh, mm. Canada has no reason to boast about how much, how, mu how much better it is than the United States. That's a lot of baloney, both, both countries are of the devil. But the way Watchtower portrays that history is that only they were persecuted. Every that every time they talk about persecution, it's only how we've been persecuted and that proves we're the chosen ones. They never mention others have been persecuted, uh, even well, right along with them. Well, the, nat the uh, native people, of course, have suffered by far the worst through the residential school systems and uh, there's, there are revelations of uh, all kinds of children buried in unmarked graves throughout Canada. Indian, as they were called uh, then, uh, had their children forced into these schools under the clergy, both Catholic and Protestant. And the Catholic were the most severe. The, Pro the Protestants have... Uh, apologized for it and paid out all kinds of money to those who went to those schools. But the Catholic Church refuses. And uh, there have been just terrible accounts of uh, young girls being uh, raped by the clergy by and uh, mistreated by the uh, nuns and so forth. And many of them lie dead in these unmarked graves and they're, they're now showing that this is, was the case using radar over these graves. And the, there's an explosion from one end of the country to the other right now. And there are many Catholic churches that have been burned down and people recently, but, recently this, this is making the news in the United States now. Yeah. It's, it's getting pretty severe there. It's, oh. it's terrible. Hundreds and hundreds of graves. Hundreds and hundreds of graves. Unbelievable. Uh, uh, there are a lot of people who have survived these schools, and this was, was terrible. And uh, it uh, uh, reminds me of the fact very much that uh, I have a lot of Indian ancestry, and uh, I'm classified under Canadian law as a Métis, which means of mixed blood. Métis is the French equivalent of mestizo in Spanish, that white and Indian. And uh, my grandfather made friends with a, my maternal grandfather made friends with a uh, family of Métis uh, just before the so-called real rebellion took place in 1885 against the federal government because they were mistreating the natives and the uh, uh, Métis so terribly. And uh, he, his, uh, uh, my great grandfather, who was a very famous half breed as they call them in those days, uh, wanted his daughter to be safe. She was only 13 and a half and he didn't want her dragged off to the residential schools. So he and my grandfather and his, my great grandfather's wife and daughter 
uh, went all the way to the western part of Montana. And uh, my grandfather, who was in his 20s, married my uh, Métis grandmother when she was only 13 and a half. Wow. And uh, thus, uh, and after she died, she died in 1914, many years later, after having lost a number of children. Uh, my uh, grandfather, who was maternal grandfather, who was Métis or was white, told his children, please don't associate with that community because you'll be terribly persecuted. So I know about that persecution from a racial standpoint, too. And uh, my aunts, uh, one of my aunts in particular, and uh, my mother showed Native ancestry. And uh, so I know about the story very well of what, mm. what has happened there and the whole business of racism. And my father... Uh, his grandfather had fought with the Union Army and was with uh, uh, the uh, Northern forces when Lurie, when uh, General Lee surrendered at Appomattox Courthouse. And uh, all the, my grandmother and my father told me about the whole business of the Civil War, because although they were both born after it, that great grandfather fought in the war. He was an old Irishman who came to the United States and uh, joined, joined the Union Army and with, fought at the end of the war. He was with uh, uh, the Canadian Army, or the American Army, rather, the Union Army is what I meant to say, pardon me. And uh, he was very proud of the fact that he had helped end slavery. And that's why I have this tradition. That's why I like the history of Henry Grew and George Storrs, that pre-Watchtower history, because they were in that abolitionist movement against slavery. And, and they suffered persecution because of that as well. Oh, George Stewart yeah. was beaten. Yeah. He was beaten for it and, and driven out of the Methodist church because of it. So all of these things, I'm, I hold dual citizenship, American and Canadian, and I know the sins of both countries, and they're, they're awful. Now, your story, after you wrote Jehovah's Witnesses in Canada, what made you question? What was it that made you question and led you to leaving? 